This is Profit from the Inside with Joel Block. Strategies to give your business the inside track. And now, here's your host, Joel Block. All of us are always looking for new ways to put the word out about our businesses, about ourselves, about the things that we need to promote. And all of us should be asking the question about what are some of the new ways to use technology, to use media, to put the word out so we get maximum exposure all the time above and beyond all the noise that's in the uh, the current digital sphere. So to discuss that with us today is audio and business expert, David Wolf. David, welcome to the show. Joel, thanks for having me. Great to be with you. Hey, listen, it's uh, it's a pleasure to have you. I want to I give a special shout out. David is uh, the producer of this show. Uh, he is a sharp guy. I, I know him uh, well. I know him personally. And he just does a great job. And, and I think you bring a lot of insights. And, you know, every time I talk to you, you know, and you tell me kind of what the backstory or kind of what the the underpinnings of how this uh, this whole audio business world works. Uh, it, it's very different from a lot of the other things that we all do. And I thought that uh, the audience would be interested to hear what it is. So uh, hopefully you'll dish a little bit on some of the stuff that uh, we don't all get to hear all the time. Yeah, sure. No, absolutely, Joe. You know, a lot of this stuff happens behind the scenes and and, uh, and part of my business really is built around the idea of stripping away the weeds, getting, getting uh, content generators, speakers, authors, coaches, uh, consultants out of the weeds of audio so that they can actually focus on the content that they're producing and wanting to distribute. Well, you know, you just mentioned kind of the traditional content creators, but you know, I've got a lot of uh, corporate executive clients that uh, they also need to get into the flow okay. of releasing uh, knowledge because these are people that have lots of unique knowledge. So let's, let's focus on those guys because on those people, sure. because they, they really, these are people who are flying all over the world. They're having high level meetings. They're interacting with other executives Right. Uh, very different from speakers, authors, and, and some of the people that, uh, that we frequently uh, connect with. In, in my hedge fund world, you know, one of the things that people always say is you know, that I have the inside track on a lot of cool stuff. Well, you know, these executive people have the inside track on a lot of cool stuff too, and, and that's what we want to feed them with. So help us um, first understand, you know, what are, what are some of the big platforms? We'll kind of dig into the weeds as we go along. But what are some sure. of the platforms? Well, uh, my business is a uh, twofold, really. I've got a podcast production company, and then I, in tandem, I run an audiobook uh, production and publishing uh, enterprise. So, so there are different places where these products show up. Uh, there is some cross-pollination, you could say. But in general, uh, let's take the audiobook side of the market. I mean, you're really looking at the big three is Audible, Amazon, iTunes. Um, they're controlling probably 70 to 80% of the market. Now, behind those three big ones, uh, which are essentially controlled by Amazon, I'm, with the exception of Apple, is in there. But when I submit a title that's an audiobook, those are the big three that we focus on. Um, they set the technical specs for audio, and they have the most robust distribution system. Because when you publish on uh, those three, your, your audiobook version is t is uh, attached to the page where your print and ebook versions are as well, Joel. So so it really helps bolster your page with yet another version, another way for people to consume that content. Now, so, yeah, so before we kind of dig into it, though, let, let's look at something. Uh, let's just understand kind of some basics. Uh, when you publish on Kindle, and I've got a I've got a book on uh, on Amazon. You, you got a Kindle version. Mm -hmm. Or you got your Kindle version, and then you got your your regular uh, physical version. So you're talking about adding another kind of version that just is digested by people. So some people, I thought that I thought that uh, what's the name of that service? Audible. I thought Audible is the one that uh, delivers all this stuff. Audible, Amazon, iTunes. Those are the three. Oh, so Amazon and iTunes are, are big in the same business. The, actually, Amazon and Audible are together. They're, they're one in the same company. I, I may have uh, misspoke a moment ago and said Amazon, iTunes, uh, uh, and uh, Audible. I may have said it in a, in a different order, but the truth is it's Audible, Amazon, iTunes. So uh, that's correct. Okay. So uh, 
would somebody ever release a, a, a uh, an audio book only, not a, a, not a physical book, or do they always do the uh, physical book first? It's a great question. So th- the system, the technology for uploading and publishing on the Audible, Amazon, iTunes, that ecosystem requires that you already have some version of the book already live. It can be an ebook, and in, with many, I have a couple of publishers I work with. Uh, what the process when we start a production is we go claim that title. So they have to have a pre-existing presence online for sale on Amazon. Uh, it can be any of those types. It can be an ebook. It can be a paperback. It can be a hardback, but it has to be already existing before we can add an audible or an, an audio book to it. Okay. So, so let's say that, uh, so a book is a book. It's uh, they're, they're 500 years old. Um, you know, Kindle is just a book that you can take with you uh, digitally. So it's really kind of kind of like the same as the book. Right. But an audio book is a different thing. Uh, that's that's where the author actually reads it to you like a bedtime story, right? They, they're, they're reading it to you. Is that what that is? Well, yes. Uh, effectively, you're being read uh, the book uh, as it was written. And sometimes some liberties are taken. But essentially, some narrator is reading to you. Uh, there's a little bit of a nuance there. Uh, my business both hires professional voiceover talent, and we also, in many cases, and we were talking about this offline, in many cases, I suggest to the author that they, if they're the voice of the brand, which in many cases, you know, that's true, they should be that voice. If they have the ability to be on a mic for two hours at a time, work with me to record it. So sometimes we hire professionals and sometimes we take the author and we leverage their speaking ability their ability to orate their presence and we uh, yes as you've said read the book to the listener that's not easy i mean i'm not i'm not a great <laughs> read out louder you know i mean i haven't read out loud since i was in grade school right uh, i mean so how many people are really good at that is it hard for do people find it hard well there's there's a very there's a, a spectrum of of capacity uh when you're dealing with <laughs> non with non that's a nice friendly way to say that right i have had authors that said well i'd like to do this and it this was early early on when i was producing uh, joel and it, it was a train wreck there was one particular case the guy was a pastor and you know he was i, was, I think i'm thinking to myself Stuff. Yeah, he knows how to speak to a room of people. It's very different. This is really to the core of your question. It's really different to read into a microphone in this focused way for a period of time, uh, sentence after sentence after sentence, articulating the words in a way that feel natural, but they're still really easy to understand. And like what, what, what you and I do in the podcast world, connecting with that audience, a reader of an audiobook has to do that. They have to be able to really engage and, and modulate and, and, and track the content in a way that is going to grab that listener. And not everybody can do this, even if they're a wonderful writer and they may even be a great speaker to a room. This is a very different thing. And that's really I mean, what, so you're do you, what So what do you do? You give them like a little reading test? I mean, do you, do you test it? Now out? I do, yeah. So I told this nightmare story, right? So now I have a, an in-depth conversation with an author that says, I absolutely have to read my own book. And I'm, okay, well, let's, let's just, you know, here's what it's going to be. It's going to be two hours at a time. You got to stay hydrated. You have to um, be clear. You have to be able to um, modulate properly. So sometimes if I have a doubt, a lot of times I've, from talking to them, I'll have them read a little bit and yeah, this is going to be fine. But if I have a doubt, I'll have them do a test with me and, uh, you know, in a little expanded test, a couple of paragraphs to get a feel for whether, because some people, um, they read differently than they talk. And if we lose them in the reading process, the mechanics of reading, like you said, I haven't read out loud since I was in uh, you know, middle school, um, that it's not going to work because it's going to sound like it's not even them. It's not their personality, which is the reason they should be doing it in the first place. So. But, you know, tell you what's funny about this is just yesterday, uh, I was talking to a guy that's producing an audio book right this minute. And it was yeah. read by a professional narrator. Right. And when he heard it, he rejected the entire, the entire thing. He just rejected mm-hmm. it out of hand. Yep. Because he just thought that the guy, uh, the, the narrator who was reading his material, just wrecked it up in a way that he didn't like. I mean, he, right. just, he, uh, he put the emphasis on things where the emphasis didn't belong. And he, right. he just did things that the author didn't like. Yep. And, and he's yep. going back to square one. He's going to do it himself. Yep. So, you know, but I also have heard. Uh, that that this is really a lot of work. I mean, I know ma- I know many people have produced these audiobooks, and and what they tell me is that this really takes some effort. You, you can only do a little bit every day. You can't do it all in one sitting. You can't bang it out. 
I mean, so uh, it, it's not so much work that it scares you away, but I mean, I've heard that it, this is not an easy thing to do. No, it's not easy if you're not used to it. It can drain you because of the level of focus that's required. And, and look, my job is to engage an author to produce them and get the best performance out of them possible. I use a remote recording system. So we do what I call progressive scheduling. So we do two hours and then we see how far we get and then we schedule the next one. Sometimes I'll schedule a couple in a row, you know, Tuesday and then right, Thursday. So, uh, so beyond the minutia, um, right. tell me why it's worth it to produce <laughs> audio books. I, I mean, you know, cause now I'm sitting thinking, boy, it sounds like kind of a lot of work. It sounds like it's kind of a lot of trouble. It, it's not going to be that easy to do. Sure. Uh, oh, uh, I'd like to hire an outside guy, but then the guy might not read in the voice that I like. So yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, this, this whole thing, it, it's right. as, as, as we talk about it, there are some complexities. Why is it even worth it to jump through the hoops to make this happen? Well, let's just talk about the value of an audio product, whether you read it or somebody else reads it, first of all. And this is going to sound a little, it's a bit of my Kool-Aid, but I have to share it because it's the reason I'm in business and, and the reason I chose this part of the audio market to participate in. I believe that there's a whole uh, huge, huge market of of listeners, it's not even so much that I believe it. We know it's there. It's a $2.5 billion on the retail side market of people consuming audiobooks because they don't feel they have the time to sit and read or they actually don't have the time to sit and read. So whether it's percep perception or reality, they don't. So here's an opportunity for an author. The book is already written. Now we're going to repurpose that content so we can get people while they're jogging, while they're walking, while they're biking, while they're running errands, while they're working around the house, whatever. You can capture this audience that otherwise would not be exposed to your content. That's the core reason I believe the audio market has been exploding at 30% since 2015, and that's year-over-year year numbers, uh, because more people are just inundated and they don't feel they have time to sit and read. You know, uh, you talk about listening to one of these things on a bicycle. I mean, that sounds like distracted uh, driving, you know, they're, they're listening to it in a car, <laughs> yeah, which, which, which I guess, you know. Right. But, you know, uh, different people uh, absorb things in different ways. You know, you've got those kinetic learners and, and you've got these different kind of learning styles and everything. Exactly. Uh, I personally uh, do better when I look at the words on the page. But there are other people who just love uh, listening to the words and, and they just do great. And, you know, uh, listen, my son, I remember when he was little, uh, you know, he used to listen to and read at the same time uh, right. Harry Potter. And that's right. actually how he learned to read. Is right. the, the narrator read it along and he read it with him. And, and that was it, you know. So that's really cool. Kind of yeah. Thing. yeah. Well, Audible has this product called Whisper Sync where you can alternate between a, a Kindle version and an audiobook version. So, and it remains like you, you can find your place again when you go back to one form or the other. Uh, it's called Whisper Sync. And so... Uh, as it goes, if you narrate a, an audio book and you're 97% accurate to the written version, the ebook version, uh, your, your book can be available as a whisper sync product. On well, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what my takeaway is from this is that, uh, you know, just like we have email, text, voicemail, phone calls, you know, 40 years ago, uh, if you need to get somebody on the phone or 30 years ago, even uh, you'd call them and that was it. Now, yeah. uh, you know, calling is like one of your last choices. You got <laughs> voicemail, you, you got mm -hmm. Skype, you got Zoom, you got, uh, you know, messaging, messenger. I mean, you got so many different ways. And I guess that our job as business people is to deliver material to people in the way that they want to receive it. Yes. We've kind, of, we've kind of developed into a society where people like having a lot of choices. Yes. In the old days, we had one choice. We didn't know any better. That was the only choice we had. Uh, Henry Ford starts with one car and then mor morphed into many cars. But uh, right now we have many, many communication choices. And I guess uh, the more choices we give people, the more successful we're going to be in getting our message out. Yeah, I think if you're building a platform, a brand, whether you're uh, an executive like much of your audience or uh, some of those other subsectors, the coaches and speakers and, and the like, a professional business person, building a platform means being in as many places as you can efficiently. So here we're repurposing the written word to the audio word. And I have some clients that even take it a step further and say, hey, we want access to the raw recordings of the audiobook." that so-and-so is going to read because we want to use little sound bites in their podcast. So that's even happening where you have this cross repurposing, cross pollination repurposing thing going on between different audio outlets and channels. 
So what about this? I go do a keynote for a company and at the end, maybe the company bought some of my books and we pass out the books. Sure. Uh, is it possible to pass out a card for them to get a download of the audiobook? Absolutely. For that, is that possible? Absolutely, it is possible. You, in that case, you probably do it from your own website. Um, there also are a couple of platforms. I don't have them at the tip of my tongue where you can set up kind of a, a shopping cart environment, and you'd price it at zero, and they'd have a download. Um, these are MP3. Usually, audiobooks are delivered, not usually, but always. They're delivered in a series of smaller files, you know, to make up the whole book. You know, the opening, the acknowledgments, the dedication, all the chapters, chapter, 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 uh, the closing, etc. So, it's a, it's a bunch of audio files that you download for listening later on your mobile device or your desktop or whatever that looks like. And, and we'll wrap up on audiobooks here, but... Uh, yeah. How does distribution of audiobooks work? I, I can right. distribute it like we just talked about, you know, where right. I can sell my thing and then I can give it out somehow. I can drive traffic to my own chapter, my own uh, right. page on uh, Amazon. Right. But how else does it happen? How else do people get, let's say you produce one of these things, who are the people that are selling them? How does it work? So as a publisher or someone, uh, my company assists publishers or self-published authors, uh, the audio product, when it's complete, typically will get uploaded to a platform such as ACX, which is the back end of Audible. And then it goes out to Audible, iTunes, and Amazon, as I was saying earlier. Those are the big three. Now, there are alternatives that I make available to the folks I work with where you can include those three, but also extend it out to some 30 or other platforms, uh, channels. These are really, they're not platforms. They're distribution channels. They're public libraries, university libraries. There's a whole list of... So the, of, the, uh, file, the file's the same. Exactly. You're selling, you're selling the same groceries. It's just going to different kinds of stores. Basically. That's exactly right. And each one pays the author a different split out on their royalties, which is, is, is pretty important to know. Um, just to mention a few, just for the heck of it, um, of these retail channels. I mean, uh, Barnes & Noble Nook, Scribd, TuneIn, uh, S-Stories, Playster, 24 Symbols, Hummingbird. I mean, a lot of these are a little bit obscure. Overdrive is a little more popular. Um, Baker & Taylor are pretty well known. So these are audio publishing platforms where you can uh, distribute your work. And who keeps track of the royalties? I mean, is there a centralized place or yes. how does it work? Yes. When you upload to the centralized platform that then redistributes to these sub channels, you'll get reporting and the range of royalties will be anywhere from uh, 70 or 80%, somewhere in the 70 to 80% for some of the, uh, I'll call them the smaller, lesser known players. Uh, the Audible, iTunes, Amazon uh, distribution agreement says that if you do an exclusive with those three, um, you'll get 40%, okay, off the top. And if you do a non-exclusive, which gives you the ability to, we talked earlier about giving them away, selling them from your own website, whatever you want to do, you have complete freedom, uh, you'll get 25% of sales. So Audible, Amazon, iTunes hold on to quite a bit of... Uh, the uh, the money it's it's you know in many cases we talk about is this f about the money in some cases it just isn't unless you're going to sell thousands and thousands of audiobooks a lot of times it's really just about reaching your target audience in a alternative way to print well listen it's not any different for books unless you're uh, you know selling a book that's going to sell a, an awful lot of copies a hundred thousand or more uh, the book is not is not where the money is it, right. the, the book is really a calling card. It's, it's something, a demonstration of your expertise in some other way. So uh, interesting. Well, let's shift gears. Let's talk about podcasts because this is, this is another exploding area. I love uh, the whole podcast business. I, I know many, many people that run podcasts. Uh, this podcast is really cool and, and you've really kind of opened the door to a lot of ideas for me about how this business works. Uh, but there's a lot of nuance to it. There's a lot of things that make uh, podcasters successful. Why don't you just share a couple of a couple of things? Give us the inside track on what it makes uh, or what it takes for somebody to succeed in this business, and uh, can they do it themselves? I mean, I was always told you just set up an account with Libsyn and then you just send it there. I, I never believe it's that simple. Well, like a lot of businesses, it's evolved over time. When I started, it was uh, 2005 or thereabouts, and you know. Many of the podcasters of in that time would very. It was a very simple thing. Once you got past the recording mechanics, it was just about creating an MP3 file, 
maybe you had an intro and an outro and you got it out there. And, uh, and Apple was really the main player then in terms of the distribution model. Um, the ability to count and uh, get accurate metrics uh, had not yet matured. And it's still something I was just reading uh, Podcast Business Today, which is a uh, popular uh, uh, publication that, that's out there just constantly reporting on the evolution of this business. So it's, we're still very much in the infancy. Um, I tend to focus on the content side because we're an audio production company uh, to a lesser degree on distribution, but it's all hugely, hugely important. And you could argue that the distribution might be more important, but I'll start with the content piece. So you've got this range of ways you can deliver audio and you really have to find your voice or your format, better word, uh, to, to express what it is you want to do in terms of your business case. So if your business case is you want to meet more people and uh, people that you want to do business with, one popular way to, uh, I'll say, monetize or leverage the platform of a podcast is to invite people on your show to have a conversation with them. These are people you want to associate with or do business with. And so that's a very popular interview format. Um, there are others. Uh, I have a client that uh, they wrote a book about uh, uh, parenting, very highly successful people. Uh, the book was co-authored by a Harvard professor and a, an, a former Boston Globe journalist. And they wrote a book and now they're creating a podcast expression of the work they did. So this will be more narrative. It'll have a little clip of an interview and then the two of them will talk about it. So this is more of a, uh, a documentary style podcast, more intense to produce, but more appropriate for the way they want to express themselves. Well, what's great about this, uh, you know, compared to uh, terrestrial radio and some of the traditional forms of media right. is that, you know, you and I have this, uh, it airs and then people can consume it whenever they want. They can download it and they can listen to it again. They can, yeah. they can download a bunch of episodes, take them on an airplane. I mean, it really, again, it, it's self-service. We live in this self-service kind of economy and people like to digest material at their own pace when they want to, how they want to, what they want to do. And, uh, and that's really great here. And uh, as the show host, I get to pick people who I think bring something very interesting to the audience that I know uh, listens to me. Now, I don't totally know who all the people are. Uh, just like with radio, you don't always know who your people are. But you kind of have a sense about the kind of people that you attract and the kind of people that you interact with. And, and that's been a pretty powerful mechanism. Sure. So, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I like this. So where does it go? Tell us about distribution. We record well, this show, you turn it into a file. Yeah, yeah. So what, what happens is we turn it into a, file, into a file and then we upload it to, there are a whole lot of these platforms. They're so-called publishing, uh, podcast publishing platforms. Um, I uh, tend to use uh, Liberated Syndication, Libsyn, for a lot of my clientele. Uh, there are several others out there. Uh, uh, Tom Hazard has a group called Podetize, a small kind of a startup-y uh, approach. And I think the real play here uh, from a business perspective, and again, my business model is right now more focused on the generation of the audio, but I do believe, and we've talked about this all offline, there is a huge business opportunity to to bring the podcaster, what I'll call broadly speaking, a more comprehensive ROI. I want to be able to target it more effectively so that I know I'm reaching the who I want to reach rather than just leaving it out there for organic search to, for people to find me. So there's this trying to get the randomness out of it and really say, hey, look, I'm going to use LinkedIn Navigator and I'm going to target the post, this last podcast, I'm going to take my list and go fling and I'm going to shoot out because I know that this target audience, my LinkedIn list is really interested in this particular content. I think that the ability to target better, the ability to measure how long people are listening more accurately and know the who behind that listener rather than just saying, oh, it was so many downloads or so many listens a month. It'd be really nice to be able to engage and transact with that audience. And uh, so I've been contemplating various approaches to this. And I know there are several startups, I can't name them by name, but there are a lot of companies now trying to deliver, all right, we've got the content, but how do we make the, the delivery of the content and the ROI, close the loop on the marketing aspect of this, um, much more tangible, measurable, and profitable? Well, I, I just know 
that it gives me a whole different kind of dimension in terms of contacting people, talking to people. It's a very interesting thing to discuss with people. Uh, you know, it really, it opens up a lot of doors that are, that are really cool. And, yeah. uh, you know, I, I, I don't recommend everybody get a podcast, but there are certain people that just have a certain kind of reach, a certain kind of personality. And I've suggested a number of people start a podcast because they just, they kind of have what it takes to make it work. Yep. And, and cause it's working for me. I mean, I really enjoy it. I've met the most interesting people, uh, you know, really cool people have come into my life as a result of this. Oh, and, yeah. and then I can share what I learn uh, with, with people who are interested in hearing what I have to say. And yeah. the other thing is absolutely all of the above is so true. And you are absolutely natural. You have both a voice quality. That's a very appealing just from an audio, you know, as a music producer, from an audio standpoint, you have a good voice. Uh, and you've got those chops, you're naturally curious, you're very knowledgeable in many aspects of business. So it, it's perfect for be, you because you can carry on a conversation that serves your targeted audience w with just about anyone uh, who, who's a business person, uh, or even uh, you've had a couple episodes with, with creative people that found their way into the business of being creative, which I, w and I was, I loved that interview because you brought them into the uh, the pure business domain. And this, all of this positions you uh, at the center of that conversation, Joe Block. Well, you know, what's a, another interesting thing. I, I got, a, I got a, uh, a LinkedIn note from a guy recently that I had no idea who he was. He said, I listened to every yeah. one of your episodes. Wow. And as a result of something that you said or something that one of our guests said. Isn't that uh, funny? I remember it was Mark Eaton, the, uh, the famous uh, basketball yep. player, who now, by the way, has been nominated into the uh, NBA Hall of Fame. He'll be, uh, oh, I think he's cool. inducted in April. I think if that works out for him. Oh, man, that's I'm great. I'm sure it will because the guy's just fantastic. And uh, Mark's a, a personal friend of mine. And uh, right. so this listener wrote in that he'd listened to the advice that Mark gave and listened to what we talked about. And he did it. And it, it's working for him. And, and, you know, so it's the kind of thing where, you know, it, it's, it's real. You really affect people. You really touch people's lives. And, and it's, uh, it's awesome. And that's really been a, a rewarding thing. So uh, any, any, uh, any follow on tips, if, if, if people wanted to get something like this going, if they want to do it, uh, you know, what do you think? How do people decide if it's for them? Well, I think that the number one thing from the podcast perspective, you know, podcasting is an ongoing recurring activity. Uh, so you need to be prepared to make the investment from a time perspective to grow your podcast. And it takes time to build audience momentum. The other thing you can do is appear on other people's uh, podcast shows. You can participate in the ecosystem of podcasting by being a guest, kind of like I'm doing today, where now you're leveraging existing already established audiences with people who have been podcasting for some amount of time. And that's a very effective way to, to do a lot of good for your brand and your own platform uh, because naturally it becomes a promotion. Beyond that, to the to the other side of your question, which is, uh, am, is someone ready to do a podcast? I'd be happy to have a conversation with anyone who's contemplating it to help them sort that out without, you know, having a bias. You know, is this something you really want to get into? Uh, um, there are many benefits. You pointed out a few of them: the ability to meet new people, to bring, to position yourself as an expert, uh, to reach a new audiences that you would not reach through other types of marketing channels, and the intimacy of you know so-called radio intimacy, right? This idea that it's one, it's just a microphone in one person's ear at a time. That that podcast radio intimacy is something you really don't get from other types of um, uh, uh, of marketing efforts. It's, it's just, it's a unique uh, place. You're in this small little space with a guest having a conversation and there's somebody listening one at a time, as opposed to a collective room full of people. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, so, it's, it's a different, it's a different experience, it's a different medium. Yeah. You have to kind of catch on to, you know, how to connect with people in yeah. a different way, Yeah, yeah, yeah. but it, uh, but it works and it's, uh, it's been rewarding. So excellent. Um, you know, I, I should have said this at the beginning, but Everybody listening has actually heard of David. You've heard his work. His work is famous. Uh, if you have children and your children ever listened to uh, Barney, that purple dinosaur, weren't you the producer of Barney or something? Uh, yeah, I, I, well, I, I had a music production company in Dallas, and one of our 
larger clients was that big purple guy. I worked with <laughs> founders of Barney the Dinosaur at the time. It was called Lyric Studios. We were located in Dallas. They were in Allen, Texas. And actually, I was doing the music for Chuck E. Cheese restaurants uh, internationally. That was one of my other clients. And, uh, you know, those auto animatronics that they have in the, you know, the birthday yeah. thing. So we used to do the tracks for all that for several years. They were a huge client of mine. And so, um, you know, franchise thing. And uh, one of the guys that was doing two of the voices, a guy named Bob West, looked at me and said, you know, I just started working with this little startup thing called Barney the Dinosaur. They could really use some help with their music. Can I introduce you to the producer? And that's how that, I went into that project. And uh, so Bob West actually created that voice. And then we ended up producing and writing songs and doing videos and all this stuff. And all of this was parallel to my doing commercial music, you know, for big brands uh, outside of Barney. Well, listen, so it's, it's always a funny thing. So you're... Uh you're part of the brains behind the uh, the purple dinosaur. You're you're some, some little bit the action there. So yeah, you know, I was I was I was providing them with uh, musical uh, musical scores and some songs, and it was interesting to participate in the project because at the time it was growing like gangbusters. I mean, this was a five hundred million dollar you know retail franchise. Yeah. By yeah. the time you know it kind of hit its apex, you know. So well, was, then our mutual friend uh, was the uh, that's right was the attorney. For that's that, right. did all the intellectual property for that that's brand right. and protected, uh, you know, every time they'd put their name or their logo on uh, diapers or toothbrushes or uh, I, don't, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know where they, they, put, up, they put their logo on everything. Uh, yep. He was the one that, uh, that did all the uh, documentation to make sure that they got paid. Exactly. So, it was a pretty robust no, uh, merchandising yeah. program they had. Yep. Pretty, pretty awesome. So, yeah. hey, listen, David, thank you so much for, for being with us, for sharing, for uh, letting people kind of see what the inside track on. Uh, on this whole secret business, because this is kind of a secret business. I mean, the whole whole thing. But I, I really do come back to the opening question, which is really, you know, how do you how do you leverage some of the technologies and media's that are out there for uh, helping us to uh, put the word out and make sure we're not the world's best kept secret? Because there's there's no uh, you don't get a prize for being the best kept secret in business. Well said. Thanks, Joel Block. Thanks, thanks I appreciate being with you. Uh, we'll look forward to uh, being in touch. All right. Thanks, All right, Joel. Take care, man. Thank you very much. You've been listening to Profit from the Inside with Joel Block. Strategies to give your business the inside track. For more insights and to learn more, visit joelblock.com. How about a shout out and a giant thanks to my podcast producer, David Wolf, and his team at Podcast and Radio Networks. Profit from the Inside simply wouldn't be what it is without David and his team. For more information or to learn how you can launch and produce your own podcast, reach out to podcastandradio.com.